If I haven't got to meet you yet, hi, my name is Pastor Deust, and I'm a real pastor, like here at my local church. I stream from my church. This is my church office. Um, I'm a real pastor who plays Pokemon, Doom, and everything in between, all with the intention of sharing God's love with the gaming world, because I believe God loves gamers, and so do I. Thank you for stopping by. I hope you enjoy your stay. So, um, we're, we're looking at uh, a question that many of us have probably asked in the past, or, or maybe it's something that we're struggling with right now, and that's this idea of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. What is that? What This idea of an unforgivable sin. We always... Uh, you know, maybe encourage each other with these words or, or people who were like sharing the gospel with or something will say things like, no one is too far gone. Uh, the, there is nothing that you could have done that God would not forgive you of. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Um, uh, whoever calls out to the Lord will be saved. Like all, all these kind of things will encourage people with those words. But there is this one place in scripture where Jesus says something that kind of alerts all of us like way there's something that's unforgivable. So we're going to read it first, as we always do. Then we're going to look at it in context and see what is this idea? What is it saying? Um, and I hope and pray that it'll be more of an encouragement to you than a discouragement or something to be afraid of. So let's read um, in Matthew 12. I'll read you the story and then we'll, um, we'll dive into it. So in Matthew chapter 12, uh, starting in verse 22, it says, Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him, so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then, indeed, he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, here it is, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Okay, so <laughs> we've got some stuff to talk about because as soon as you hear these words um, where he says the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven, that's already like, whoa, I thought there was nothing that we could do to separate us from the love of God. There was nothing that could not be forgiven or whatever. And then he even goes further and says, whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Like he's really emphasizing this point that this is an unforgivable thing. So, yeah, that's heavy. Exactly. Exactly. So that's why it's cause for concern. That's why it's a question that comes up so often. That's why it's a topic worthy of diving into and doing a study on different things. In fact, so, here's how we're going to do this. Um, first, I'm going to give you my... Uh, kind of my my answer, my short, very short version answer to what this is. And then we're going to walk through it and look at the context, okay? Um, <clears throat> so the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit or the unforgivable sin, uh, in in a word, in a, a very short answer is um, uh, attributing the works of God to being of Satan. Um, is attributing the work of the Spirit to being done by Satan. Um, now you may say, like, what? That's such a weird thing. Like, why would that be unforgivable? What? Well, maybe I've said that. Like, what? What if in my past, uh, before I came to Christ, or maybe if I was a kid 
um, and I saw something happening or maybe even as an adult, I saw someone, you know, be healed or something. And I'm like, oh, no, that's the work of the devil or those people. They're crazy. They're, no, that's that's demonic over there. Did I do it? Did I commit the unpardonable sin? Did I blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Am I guilty of that? Um, I think it's it's a valid thing for us to to question, to think about. Um, but in a word, as we can see from the context, what the Pharisees did is they uh, they attributed the work of Christ to Satan, and they did so knowingly. They did so knowingly. So let's look at it. Um, let's walk through this because there's there's a lot here. So uh, let's start just at the top of it. He says, um, so there's this demon oppressed man. Uh, we don't get a lot of information about him in Mark, but Luke tells us something similar. Um, it says in Luke 11, now he was casting out a demon that was mute. Here it only says mute, but um, in Matthew, it tells us that he was both mute and he was blind. Uh, and when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. Okay, so back here, the demon oppressed man. He was blind and he was mute and he was brought out to Jesus and Jesus heals him. So the man spoke and saw. So pause right there. Think about this moment. So often as we're reading through scripture, we see these amazing things, these miraculous moments, and we um, we just kind of glaze over them like, oh yeah, it's Jesus. He's healing people again. Cool. All right. Then what happened? What's the what's the eternal truth I can take from it? What where's where's the stuff for me? And we don't often pause and just go, wow, our God is an awesome God. Praise God. Um, but here we see this man who is is oppressed, possessed by a demon. Uh, is blind and mute, and after he is set free, then he speaks and he can see. So we know that his uh, condition was a result of this demon oppression that he had been experiencing. And all the people were amazed. Rightfully so. If we saw that, even if it was the 10th time we had seen it, because this kind of stuff was happening a lot, um, that would be an amazing thing to see. Imagine and picture the disciples who have seen Jesus performing all these different kinds of miracles and setting people free of demons and all this kind of stuff. Um, but yet everyone is so amazed. Or I shouldn't say everyone, because there were some people there who were not amazed. But all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? So what they mean there is they're asking the question, can this be the Messiah? Can this be the one who is to come, the, the savior of humanity, the one that we've read all these prophecies about, the one who is told back in the, the Old Testament and through the prophets and, and all this kind of stuff? Can this be him? Because who else could do something like that? Um, but look at what the Pharisees say. It says, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul or yeah, it's actually, it depends on which translation you have. Uh, Beelzebul here or Beelzebub in like King James, New King James. And I'm reading out of ESV here. Um, but it is only by Beelzebul. And by the way, that's like, um, that is a uh, uh, a deity from uh, uh, the Palestinians. Um, this, uh, 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 or no, Philistine, uh, fi sorry. Philistine, Phil I can't talk. Philistine deity. There you go. <laughs> it is a Philistine deity, um, which means Lord of the Flies, uh, is Beel Beelzebub. Uh, but Beelzebul is like a, a slang name, so it's like even just kind of further talking trash about this guy. Um, so it, it's you have to picture the way that they're saying this. Like, it's only by Beelzebul, not even calling him by his right name, uh, the prince of demons that this man casts out demons. So uh, they know of this this false god that people in uh, Philistine the Philistines uh, worship, and they say that no 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 this this thing that he's doing it's by Beelzebub, and that's the prince of demons. But look at what Jesus says; he knows their thoughts, and he calls them out on it really really quick. But I mean. Hold on, let's let's look at this for a second. Or yeah, Lord of Dung, Lord of uh, Filth, Lord of Trash is is kind of the Beelzebul side of it. That's why I was saying it's like a slang kind of thing. Um, uh, Beelzebub is like Lord of the Flies, but then um, Beelzebul is uh, Lord of Trash, Lord of yeah Dung, Lord of 
filth and waste and just disgusting. So really like the worst possible thing. Now, me in my gamer side of my brain, always, every time I've read this, <laughs> um, I've always thought of uh, the boss from Castlevania Symphony of the Night where you fight Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies, and he's like this big rotting corpse hanging by chains and these giant poisonous flies are all around him and you have to kill him um, and kill all the flies who are trying to kill you, whatever. That's what I've always like pictured in, because remember, yeah, I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian, I study the word and whatever, but also I'm a gamer. <laughs> and so like those parts of my brain always collide whenever I hear the name. Um, but anyway... Uh, so the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the people who know the law, who who have got like the Torah and everything memorized, they, they are the teachers. Okay, they're the teachers of the law. And whenever they hear about this, this is their response. They're not amazed like everyone else. They're not like, wow, that's incredible. Man, maybe this is. Maybe this is the, the son of David. Maybe this is the Messiah to come that we've been looking for. Because we know what the prophet Isaiah says. We know what the, <laughs> the Old Testament predicts. Like, we know what he's supposed to be like. And that fits the bill. No, instead, their immediate reaction is, it's only by Beelzebub. Like, there was no question. There was no doubt. There was just immediate um, rejection of this work. And says, no, it's only by Beelzebub, prince of demons, prince of demons that this man notice they say man that this man casts out demons but knowing their thoughts it says jesus says to the pharisees every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste no city or house divided against itself will stand and if satan casts out satan he's divided against himself. So how then will his kingdom stand? He just gives them a perfectly logical, rational argument for that. Like what you're saying doesn't even make sense. <laughs> if I was from Satan, Jesus says, if I was from Satan and doing this by the works of Satan, then why would I be destroying my fellow demons and follow, fallen angels and stuff? Like that wouldn't make any sense. Why would I destroy my own work? Um, that would be counterproductive. That, that wouldn't make any sense. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, this is such, <laughs> such a Jesus moment here. I love the way that he, he does this kind of stuff. He says, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. So, okay, here's what you got to understand is they aren't questioning the fact that demons are being cast out. That There's no question. They see that. Yep, demons are being cast out. They acknowledge that. They believe that. Um, so often now, today, um, we struggle with like this whole um, idea of the supernatural. Just in general, even in our churches, we're, we're so like afraid of acknowledging that anything is supernatural when... God is spirit. <laughs> we worship him in spirit and in truth. There is a spiritual side to everything. Um, and often we're, we're so afraid to even acknowledge the supernatural. But here, th there was no doubt there. They didn't struggle with that. We struggle with the anti-supernatural mindset. They did not. They knew, okay, yep, this man was demon-possessed and a demon was just cast out. No question. No question asked. Um... And we even see part of that in the way that Jesus asks this question, because this is part uh, a part that we would like maybe easily jump over. Um, but he says, if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? In other words, so whenever your sons or the people that you know and you trust and you acknowledge and you whatever, when they do it, you believe that it's from God. <laughs> but why not when I do it? You see? Do you see what he's saying? <laughs> and he even tells them, therefore, they will be your judges. Like, yeah, they are doing it by the power of God because that's the only way that that could happen. It wouldn't make sense for Satan to cast out Satan. He would be divided against himself. It would not stand. That would be stupid. That would not make sense. Uh, but he says, when your sons do it, you acknowledge it's from God. So why not when I do it? But, then he really calls him out right here. But if it's by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
and they don't want to acknowledge that. They don't want to acknowledge that. Because if the kingdom of God has come upon them, then their time as the big dogs is over. Their authority as the teachers of the law and whatnot, it's challenged because he's God and we're not. But they struggle with pride. They want to be seen as the top dog, as the, the big man or whatever. Um, we see that in the uh, the parable that Jesus told about the Pharisee and the tax collector. Remember, he says two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, one was a tax collector. And the Pharisee stands up and prays loudly in front of everybody. Thank you, God, that I'm not like other men, like thieves, adulterers, or this tax collector over here. But the tax collector, who's like, you know, just no one liked the tax collector. They had a terrible reputation. They would steal and cheat people and whatever. Um, he doesn't even look up to heaven. He's just like, eyes closed, like head buried in his chest and just, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Jesus says that God heard the tax collector, but not the Pharisee, because that was the state of their heart. They would look down on everyone else. We even talked about this in our, our study yesterday on uh, Midweek Move with Geek Devotions in James 4, where he talks about that so much. The way that we talk to others, the way that we um, supposedly stand on the law, but we use it to judge others and look down on them instead of taking the plank out of our own eye and recognizing that we're all at level ground at the foot of the cross. But no, they don't want to acknowledge that the kingdom of God may, may actually have come upon us. This may be what we've been looking for. You would think, right? You would think that they would be excited about that. <laughs> that, oh, the Messiah is here. This is what we've been looking for. But as we'll go on to see through the rest of uh, his story and up to crucifixion and resurrection and everything, um, he didn't come in a way that they wanted or expected. Um, even after the resurrection, which was so weird, even after the resurrection, they still thought like, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom? <laughs> to Like, it, how are you going to do this? They just never got it, never got what he was here to do um, until he went and sent the Comforter and the Holy Spirit and it was poured out Pentecost and all that. Um, but anyway, so if the Spirit of God, if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Also, I want to highlight this right here and notice this because this is a key word in this whole study and conversation. He says, but if by the Spirit of God. That'll come into play uh, whenever we actually get down to the wording here um, about what he's saying. Then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Um, just giving that picture there that like <laughs> you have to stop the strong man first before you can come in. And if I'm just doing the same work that he's doing. Uh, if I'm, if I'm working by the power of the enemy, then I'm just divided against myself and it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you have to bind the strong man first. Whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters. He's speaking very plainly and directly to them that that's you. <laughs> that's you. Therefore, he says, I tell you, Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, people. Pause. Stop. That's huge right there. Sometimes we miss that because we're so focused on this part, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And yeah, we're going to get to that. That's what we're studying. But look at this for a second. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, people. You might say, why is that such a big deal? I know that. I know that God is a forgiving God. Yes, but that's because we live like with this full revelation on the other side of the cross. <laughs> like we know the mercy and grace of God. But then there was not like th there was no sacrifice for blasphemy. You blaspheme, you die. Period. There, there's no nowhere in the law where you are forgiven for blasphemy. If you blaspheme, you are stoned you die. So even for him to say that right there, therefore I tell you every sin, uh, that's even something because there's a lot of different sins that there's no sacrifice for. Th there's just, there's no way out of it. If you think about um, David, 
David in Psalm 51, whenever he's he's crying out to God for mercy and he's just calling on the gracious nature of God. He's like, because you are gracious, have mercy on me. Because he's murdered Uzziah and had adultery or committed adultery with uh, Bathsheba, done all that kind of stuff. Um, there, there was no sacrifice to cover his sin. He was, he was doomed <laughs> from that. Um, but he calls on the mercy, the grace of God, because God is a mercy, a merciful and gracious God. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to uh, repentance. Um, it's even in that context where he's saying over in Second Peter, First Peter, Second Peter, one of the Peters, um, that um, he says God's not not. Uh, uh, slack as some called sl- uh, count slackness. Like, where is this coming? When is he coming? When is this all going to play out? He says, no, no, he's patient. He's long suffering because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Um, but here it says, therefore, I tell you every sin and every blasphemy will be forgiven. That's huge. <laughs> that just points to the, the fullness, the finality of the atoning work of the cross, that he's going to cover it all. Every sin, every blasphemy will be forgiven. But, okay, so unpause now and move forward. But the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. So notice here, I'm going to highlight it in each of these instances. Uh, the Holy Spirit. Because look back up here in verse 28. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And here he says, the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. This is so interesting. Um, Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus. Jesus is the son of man. That's a whole really cool story, but he's calling himself God there. (laughs) Whoever speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Like why is God just being picky? And it's like, well, I could blaspheme against the father. I could blaspheme against the son, but I just got to be careful. Don't blaspheme against the spirit because that's the one. That's the one. If I do that, I will not be forgiven. Um, But look at how he says that he even does this. If you look through many of the things that Jesus says, like a lot of times, this is kind of a whole other study on just the Godhead and the hypostatic union and the nature of Christ incarnate and all that kind of stuff. I'll try not to get too far into that. But um, often whenever we think about Jesus, we just think um, just God because Jesus is God. But uh, we don't like stop and think and really evaluate some of the things that he says, like Jesus says often that I've only done what the Father has told me to do. So there's like command from the Father. The Son is, uh, in Philippians 2, he humbles himself to the will of the Father, even to the point of death on a cross, um, that he does the will of the Father. And that how does he do these things? By the Spirit of God. It's by the Holy Spirit that he does these things. Um, So that's... Like I said, that could be a whole other study. Uh, But it's interesting that that's like in the same context, he says, it's by the spirit of God that I cast out the demons. Whoa, not where I wanted to go. Uh, It's by the spirit of God that I cast out the demons and whoever blasphemes against the spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks against the son of man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Now, contextually he's speaking to some specific people he's talking to these pharisees who are right here and he's telling them flat out y'all y'all missed it (laughs) y'all are y'all are going to be an example here of this truth y'all are doomed (laughs) you are not going to be forgiven um you have done this they have okay these pharisees here they have committed the uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, just flat out. They did it. Um, and it's that they attributed the work of the Spirit of God to demons, to the devil. Um, 
so often we we don't read the very next words in this same context, but it just goes on to prove the point uh, right after that in verse 33. He says, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers. There's no mincing words. There's no, eh, you might, you might end up repenting and being saved and whatever. No, no, no. You brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. With their mouth, they attributed the works of Christ, the works of the Spirit of God to Beelzebub <laughs> or Beelzebul, <laughs> uh, even a slang version, uh, the prince of demons, they say. Um, that's the words they said, but how much more so was their heart a reflection of that? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. See, sometimes we just think about this little section in its own context and don't realize he was he's still talking to the Pharisees. <laughs> this is right after... <coughs> Um, this whole account. And he says, on the day of judgment, everyone will give account for every careless word they speak. Like, you should have thought before you spoke. <laughs> but still, they spoke out of the abundance of their heart. That's where it came from. That was their heart towards Jesus was, no, we don't want you. We reject you. And that's it. It is a willful deliberate rejection of Christ, of the work of the Spirit of God. They had no interest in seeing the Messiah. They had no interest in the coming of Christ. And when he was there, they saw it. It was undeniable. They saw this man healed. They saw him demon put out of him, all that kind of stuff. They see him supernaturally healed. They know that that can only happen by the power of God, because remember, your sons, whenever your sons do it, who's doing it then? Is it still Beelzebub or is it God? No, of course you believe that's God. So whenever I do it, you say it's demons? You say it's by the work of Beelzebub? They saw it undeniably in front of their eyes, and they deliberately, willfully rejected it because they didn't want to submit. <laughs> they did not want to submit to the authority of Christ. I'm going to catch up on chat, and then we're going to go to Romans 1, because we always go to Romans 1. But Romans 1 is kind of the next step in this. Albritton said, so can you explain the difference between blasphemy that is forgiven and blasphemy against the Spirit? Yeah, so, um, I mean... Really, I think there's a lot of things that, that we often just call other sin, which they are, but they are also a form of blasphemy, like taking the name of the Lord in vain, for example, is blasphemous. It is. It's blasphemy. Um, we would typically just think of it like in the box or the category of taking the name of the Lord in vain. And that even is so many things. That's more than just like saying the name of God in a curse word. Um, that's speaking flippantly about God, irreverently about God, um, with our words and with our actions, representing God in a careless way, um, irreverently. All those kind of things can be taking the name of the Lord in vain. Uh, but that in itself is a form of blasphemy. Um, so yeah, it, it can be, it can be lots of things, uh, for sure. But then blasphemy of the spirit or blasphemy against the spirit is like we were saying, as we can see in the context, it's, uh, specifically attributing the work of the spirit of God to, uh, demons. And it's, it's a knowing, like it's knowingly, um, it's deliberate. It's something we do on purpose. We know full well. And I think that's a, a key piece of this, um, because like I said at the very beginning, like, could I be afraid that or worried like, oh, what if I did in the past? What if I accidentally or, or nonchalantly or just ignorantly said something like that? Um, the Bible even tells us that people like um, uh, the people who like turned over Jesus and everything. It says that they acted in ignorance. But the Pharisees here, 
No, they knew full well exactly what they were doing. And they deliberately, willfully rejected God. That's what it is. <laughs> because, and I think this kind of gets into what Tam says, you deny the Holy Spirit means you don't ask him for forgiveness so you don't get forgiven. Um, yeah, and I think that's that's a huge part of this, is because as we reject God like that, um, we're also rejecting the convicting work that he does in us. Because how are we saved? No one comes to the uh, to the Father unless God draws him. Uh, we are only... Um, uh, hey, just here. Thank you for the follow. Um, it's only by the work of the Holy Spirit that we are even convicted over our sin. That, that supernatural act of regeneration where he makes us new, where he takes out the heart of stone, puts in a heart of flesh, where we are transformed, where we are a new creation. All of that is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's only by the power of the Spirit that that even happens. So if I fully reject God, if I attribute his work to demons and, and all that kind of stuff, and I'm like, no, no, no. Yeah, okay. I, I know that that's happening. I see that God is who he says he is and everything. I don't want it. I reject it. Then God says, say it with me, because we talk about Romans 1 so much. Okay. As we suppress the truth of God in our unrighteousness and in our ungodliness. He turns us over to our own sin and we destroy ourselves. That's why I said we're going to get to Romans 1 in a second, but I kind of jumped the gun there before without even pulling it up. So now we're going to jump over to Romans 1 and we're going to look at the uh, the result, the result of this. So we, we kind of already talked about it a little bit, but I want to read it with you and uh, look at... Um, in the world. That is not what I wanted to pull up. Um, what it says, we did a whole study on this not long ago. You can uh, go find that study on YouTube where we look at what is the wrath of God. Um, but right here, starting in verse 18, actually, I'm going to start in verse 16 and then we'll jump to 18. That's why it's still highlighted here. <laughs> um, but yeah, look at this. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. For as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, I'm not going to build on that like we have before, because every time I do, I become a, a crying mess, because that's just such a beautiful passage. But um, the wrath of God here, we see the wrath of God being revealed Um in well let's just read it for the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness we didn't highlight this last time but i'm going to highlight this part suppress the truth there suppress the truth for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened." Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Now, um, <clears throat> if this applies to all man, all people who have ever lived, if we all know clearly through the things that have been made that there is a God, that he has uh, made it clearly, uh, he has <laughs> made it clear to us that we have clearly perceived them ever since the creation of the world, um, his eternal power and his divine nature and the things that have been made. It says that we are without excuse. Um, how much more so is this true about the Pharisees who saw it right in front of their eyes? It says, for what can be known about God is plain to them, for God has shown it to them. We see it in everything. We know there's like that inner, inner part of us that's like, yeah, there is a God. I, I know there is, I might not understand or be able to define, or, or I may have different theories and, and whatever and come up with different ideas of how this all works. But um, somewhere deep down, we all know that there is a God. How much more so is that true for them? Um, the more light that we have, uh, the more 
we are accountable for. Uh, like Jesus said in John 9, um, uh, if you were blind, you wouldn't, uh, or how does he say it? Hold on, I'm going to pull it up. It's in John 9. Yeah, Jesus said to him, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. In other words, now that you know that you realize um, the truth, you're held accountable for that truth. Um, but so how much more for the Pharisees who knew the law, who knew the prophets, who knew all that, who were teachers of the law, um, how much more will they have to answer for and be held accountable to? But it's by their unrighteousness that they suppress the truth. They knew it was God. They saw Jesus doing those miracles. They knew a hundred percent. So whenever you read it in Matthew, uh, Matthew 12, don't be fooled by their words. Like they're trying to fool the people. Okay. Um, it says, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it's only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. They're trying to convince these people who are amazed that no, 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 no. He couldn't be God. He couldn't be the Messiah. He couldn't be the son of David. It's by the demons. Because again, they wanted to hold their own authority. They didn't want to have to accept the fact that the kingdom of God has come upon you, like he says in verse 28. And like they even know that, yes, demons are actually being cast out here. We know that. And when our sons do it, we attribute that work to God. But when this man does it, no, that's the work of demons. <sighs> they suppress the truth in their unrighteousness, even though they see it clearly. That's why the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and unforgivable sin is attributing the works of the Spirit of God knowingly willfully to uh, to the devil. It's just flat out, willful, complete rejection of God. That's what it is. It is rejecting God. So what does he do? What does God do? Therefore, Romans 1, 24, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Here the second time, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And the third time, verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, therefore <laughs> God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Wow. Okay, so we understand what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, what this unforgivable, unpardonable sin is, um, why it's unforgivable, all those kind of things. So here's what I want you to take away is first off, um, if there's any like fear or stress or worry or concern in you that you may have committed this, take a deep breath and recognize that by the very saying of the, those words, by that very reality, no, you have not. Because if you had willingly, deliberately, knowingly, rejected God completely, then there would be no conviction in your heart because the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts. That is one of the workings of the Spirit in our life. He convicts us of sin and draws us to himself. His kindness leads us to repentance. If you have fully rejected him, you would, you would hate him. You would have no concern. You would not care at all if you had 
uh, done anything against him. If you had blasphemed the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't care. You'd look for an opportunity to do it again. That would not be your concern. Um, but if you are concerned, if you are worried about that, then that means no, you have not committed the unper unpardonable sin. Um, so that alone should be a very comforting reminder. Um, here's a couple of maybe challenges or warnings about this. Um, I would say that we should be gracious in the area of um, how we see God moving and working. Um, a lot of times people uh, struggle to believe things like God healing someone or delivering someone or whatever. And I would say, be careful with that. Not because I'm afraid you're going to commit the unpardonable sin or the unforgivable sin, but by recognizing that that was the end state of the Pharisees themselves. They, they had already rejected God. They didn't want anything to do with God. They wanted their own system and their own understanding. So they rejected God, even knowing and seeing it happen. Um, but so often we are quick to criticize if we hear about something like someone being healed or, or someone experiencing some supernatural thing or something. And we're quick to criticize uh, instead of being gracious and saying, wow, praise God, praise God. You may have even noticed I do that a lot in Twitch chat where people will come in and they'll, they'll say something awesome that God has done in their life or something. And it may be something I'm a little confused about or something, or I don't know what that means or how did that work or wait, really? That, oh, wow. I've never once questioned that. I'm never going to. I always say the same thing. Wow. Praise God. Praise God. Um, so I would say be quick to show grace there, to err on the side of giving glory to God. Now, if that person is out of their mind or just outright lying or looking for attention to look super spiritual or something, leave it up to the Holy Spirit to convict them. <laughs> um, if there's questions, sure, ask questions. Uh, that That's not a problem. But it's where we just immediately are like, no, just that's evil. That's sinful. That's demonic. No, I ain't going to listen to it. That's where I'd say, well, let's hold up. Let's be a little cautious there because that was the end state of the Pharisees. As soon as they saw it, they immediately rejected it. But again, it's because they had already rejected God. Um, trying to think if there were any other, uh, it seemed like there was another warning on that. I guess not. Um, but so, yeah, those would be my applications piece, my, my things to take away from the study, from this uh, conversation. This should be a comforting thing. This shouldn't be something that we walk around in fear or worry or stress over, worrying if we've done it, worrying if we will do it. No, if you're in Christ, if you're a new creation, you're never going to attribute the works of God to the devil. You're never going to outright reject God um, because you have been born again. You have been made new. Uh, that that won't happen. That can't happen. Um, so I hope that's encouraging to you. I hope that's a blessing to you. But let me catch up on chat because y'all said some things.